Rulers have been keeping collections of exotic animals for at least three and a half thousand years. The first were collected by the ancient Egyptians, who kept them as symbols of their great wealth and power, and also as representatives of the gods. The ancient Greeks, Chinese and Romans also kept menageries of exotic animals. The 1600s brought in the area of colonisation and trade expansion by the European powers, and the ships sometimes brought back tales of mysterious and wonderful beasts and occasionally living specimens, and this fueled public demand to see the menageries of exotic animals that began to be created. The first modern zoos were founded in Europe in the late 1800s and the early 1900s. They initially comprised ornate buildings with elaborate gardens and hence became known as zoological gardens. Competition grew up between the different zoos to try to have the most diverse and exotic collection of animals. So expeditions were organised to go out to the uh, wild frontier countries to try to trap and acquire and transport back some of these amazing specimens. And due to lack of knowledge about uh, nutrition and husbandry, mortality and injuries during transportation and capture were often very high. Little was known about the needs of these exotic animals in the early zoos and the enclosures used were often small, barren and with enclosing bars. The space provided to the human visitors was often significantly greater than the space provided to the animals. In the 20th century, the sciences of zoo biology, nutrition, veterinary care, animal husbandry continued to expand and the enclosures became much larger and much more naturalistic. Modern zoos today are large corporate enterprises with multiple functions, including entertainment of visitors, conservation and education, rehabilitation of animals prior to release, and also, of course, uh, employment and profit generation. There's been an increasing focus on the welfare of uh, animals maintained in modern zoos, and also on more recent conceptual understandings, such as the need uh, of animals to be able to not just avoid negative experiences, but to have positive ones in their lives as well. Staff have become increasingly knowledgeable and trained in topics such as biology and zoo animal husbandry. Veterinary care programs have been established to try to prevent uh, animal diseases and where they do occur to try to uh, diagnose them and treat them appropriately. And this has been combined with increasing sophistication of nutritional programs for the animals as well. Zoos have tried to provide environmental enrichment in terms of increasing space with uh, burrowing substrates available for burrowing animals, horizontal space for uh, flying birds. Novel objects, sounds, odours and events can be provided to animals, such as spraying perfume on branches which stimulates investigation and rubbing by canids such as providing cardboard boxes with staples removed which can be attacked and killed by large carnivores, and such as providing things like floating beer kegs which may be investigated by bears. The objective of these types of enrichment devices is to provide the animals with uh, puzzles, challenges, and the opportunity to make choices, to stimulate their cognitive faculties, and also to stimulate a wider array of their natural behavioural repertoire. In the wild, most species spend a large proportion of their waking hours uh, trying to seek out food, uh, apprehend prey animals, hide food from competitors, and so on. Gorillas, for example, spend up to 70% of their day foraging, and black bears about 75% of their day. Accordingly, keepers try to provide nutritional enrichment by doing things like hiding food under logs, in crevices in rocks, or freezing food into blocks of ice for bears. Social partners can be an infinite form of stimulation and provide valuable social enrichment for social species, and even human keepers can provide this when there are positive animal-keeper relations. Despite all of these efforts, unfortunately it remains true that zoo animals are confined in pretty limited environments, their natural social networks are disrupted, and they have a limited ability to fulfil all sorts of interests that are very important to them. Reproduction is an obvious example. Unfortunately, many of the animals that would result from natural reproduction are not genetically or behaviourally suited to be reintroduced into the wild, and accordingly, uh, reproduction has to either be prevented uh, by surgical interventions or by repeated hormonal injections, where these are even available for the species concerned, 
or else the animals have to be denied the opportunity to engage in this very important natural behaviour, or else they're allowed the opportunity but the offspring then have to be killed, which is uh, very sad. And this is sometimes termed zoothanasia, which is a misuse of the term euthanasia because euthanasia refers to killing uh, strictly speaking, that is not only humanely conducted, but is also conducted in the best interests of the animals concerned. And usually that's because they're suffering from something like a severe disease or injury uh, from which they're unlikely to recover. A major justification for continuing to keep animals in zoos is that they make an important contribution to conservation of endangered species. Captive breeding programs with reintroductions into the wild do occur, but unfortunately, as a general rule, the numbers of successful reintroductions is usually very low and it's very difficult to justify the enormous expenditure uh, that goes into these programs uh, in light of the actual benefit that is derived from them. It's also argued that the use of uh, precious resources in this way is a distraction from the more important issue of conserving the uh, natural environment in which the remaining endangered species continue to reside and that to do that would be a more efficient use of the money involved. It's also argued that zoos have an important role to play in educating visitors about wild animals and about conservation matters. Unfortunately though surveys have indicated that the average zoo visitor spends somewhere between 30 seconds and 2 minutes reading information about zoo animals at enclosures and they're often more interested in being entertained. They want to see animals doing things, uh, whereas the animals are, of course, not domesticated species uh, very often, and they actually are uncomfortable being up close to human beings, and they want to hide, and this creates a problem. Uh, the zoo needs visitors to uh, pay the entrance fees and to keep coming back, so they need them to be entertained. This conflicts with the animals' need to hide away from people, this can be solved by uh, placing cameras inside animal enclosures and by giving the visitors some choice over the control of the cameras by use of things like joysticks and selecting uh, certain cameras to display on screens, it enables the visitors to do something. It increases the interactivity of the exhibit, which visitors also enjoy. As technology continues to develop, it's likely that we'll be making increasing use of things like virtual reality exhibits instead of live animals at zoos. Zoo Atlanta, for example, is now piloting a virtual reality exhibit that gives visitors the perspective of a gorilla, allowing uh, them as a virtual gorilla to interact with their environment and see the world in the way that a gorilla would. Perhaps this is a way to maximise interactivity of exhibits for people maximise the entertainment value, maximise the educational value and minimise the uh, animal welfare impacts uh, incurred by having live animals within zoos.